tonight. I'd like to ask you to continue to uh, pray for Connor, the young boy who's got the tumors in his brain. And remember my wife, she's not been feeling too well lately, and the hard-headed thing won't, uh, <laughs> she won't go to the doctors. She doesn't like them. She won't take an aspirin. Heart, you about got to hold her down and force it down her throat, you know, but you know, <laughs> pray for her that God will give her enough sense to go and get looked at. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to stand tonight, and I'm, I'm trusting that the Lord will, will help me say something might be a help to somebody here this evening. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, I come to you, Father, uh, asking that you fill me with the Holy Ghost. Lord, use me, Father, to uh, be a help to some soul this evening. Father, I believe I'm in a house full of folk that are saved, or at least profess to be saved, and they're making an effort to uh, live a life that's pleasing to Thee, Lord. And God, I pray that You would help us to get some light about how that's best to be done. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Let's start in the book of Matthew. Let's see here. I believe it's Matthew. Where am I? Well, I had all that stuff right here in my heart, next to my heart. Give me just a second here. Notice how professional I am. <laughs> uh, Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter number 18, I believe it is. Well, no, it's not. Which one is it? All right, let's go to Luke 22 then. We'll start it there. I'm looking for different narratives to this same situation. And uh, I couldn't find the one that I'd prefer to have used, but that's all right. I'm using the one God wants me to, I would assume. We'll start reading in verse number 13. It says, And they went and found as he had said unto them, and they made ready the Passover. And when the hour was come, he sat down, and the twelve apostles with him. And he said unto them, With desire I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. And he took bread and gave thanks and break it and gave unto them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Likewise also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood which is shed for you. And behold, the hand of him that betrayeth me is with me on the table. And truly the Son of Man goeth as it was determined, but woe unto that man by whom he is betrayed. And they began to inquire among themselves which of them it was that should do this thing. And there was also a strife among them, which of them should be accounted the greatest. And Jesus said unto them, The kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them. And they that exercise authority upon them are called benefactors. But ye shall not be so. But he that is greatest among you, let him be as the younger. And he that is chief is he that doth serve. For whether is greater, he that sitteth at meat or he that serveth, is not he that sitteth at meat, but I am among you as he that serveth. Ye are they which have continued with me in my temptations, and I point unto you a kingdom as my Father hath appointed unto me, that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom, and sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. 
Now, you may be seated, of course, here. The setting is the final Passover, what we call the Last Supper. It's the gathering, the last gathering that Jesus was going to have with His disciples. The last time He'd be able to dine with them and have a discussion with them about what was going to happen to Him. And as He's talking about these things, and, and He's giving them the wine and saying, this is the New Testament in my blood, and He's giving them the bread, saying, this is my body, which is broken for you. And He's even saying that one of your own number is going to betray me. In the midst of all of that, they, first of all, began to inquire, well, who's going to be the Judas, so to speak? Who's the traitor? Who will betray him? But then, the conversation pretty soon turned away from the Lord unto themselves, where they had a strife among them, which of them should be accounted the greatest. Now I think that's a profound thing. Amen. It says a lot about the human heart. Amen. About the human condition. About the deceitfulness of pride. And uh, about the fact that ambition is the enemy of spirituality. Amen. It absolutely is. We live in a day in an age where the fact that a man has a diploma on a wall, the school that he's attended, the men who he's friends with count for more than whether or not that individual is filled with the Spirit of God. It's sad but true. We live in a day when rather than Fire-breathing preachers standing behind the pulpits. They're occupied by pulpiteers. Men who have not had their desert experience with the Lord. Who have not entered into a intimate relationship with God. And been in a situation where God has taken and stripped away all the veneer and stripped them down to what they really are for them to see that they might see Him as He really is. Amen. People, the majority of our preachers today that you see are the, pro the product of the ministerial manufacturing companies that we call Bible colleges and cemeteries. I'm sorry, at seminaries. <laughs> They go and they teach them all the doctrines. They teach them all about sermon preparation. They teach them all about how to deliver it, the gesticulation that you, may, you should use, and when to raise your voice and the proper inflection to use. They teach them all of these things, how to enthrall an audience, how to get them to be on your side and help you to build a ministry, but they don't teach them. They have no course in how to be filled with the Holy Ghost. I've looked through some of the catalogs of some of the schools, and they have hermeneutics, they've got prophecy, they've got a number of subjects, but they're very little said about the preparation of the heart in the preparation of a man for the ministry. And I think the reason for that is because the majority of people who are in the ministry starting 40 or 50 years ago were in the ministry because they were mama called and papa sent. Mama decided she'd like to have a preacher in the family and papa said, you got to go and make your own way. <laughs> Amen. Well, you know, they didn't want to work, and they figured, well, preaching looks pretty easy. What, it takes them about five hours a week to go to the church and do their work, and, and uh, basically, that's what many of them do. 
You know, if you're a member of some associations, if you're a Sunday school teacher, they send around the uh, lesson booklets for that quarter of the year, and you teach the lesson that is presented before you, and it requires really no study whatsoever. All you've got to do is read it. It's so simple that somebody who spends the whole week in a bar could come to church on Sunday morning and be recognized as a Sunday school teacher. They've got, uh, uh, there are preachers in certain denominations who are so popular and so admired by those in their denomination that they send out booklets of their sermon outlines that you might be able to preach the words of that great man. And if you're not educated, if you don't have the opportunity or the financial ability to attend a school, there are other ways that you can end up being a product of something besides the calling of God. One of the things that's common, something that was a pitfall I fell into when I first got called to preach was this. There were some evangelists that would come through our church that were firebrands. I mean, brother, they'd preach and the altars would be filled. They'd preach and, and sinners were gripping the back of the pews, their knuckles white from the pressure they were putting on them. The women would weep. People would be born again. Backsliders would get right. And it, it was all because of the presence of this man. But then over the years, I began to realize that when the revivalist came, the meeting happened. The crowd was whipped up into an emotional frenzy. And then he packed up. The meeting closed down. He went on down the road to the next church. In a couple of weeks, everything except for an individual here and there, everything by and large returned to its previous state. Those who were lackadaisical in their study and prayer life remained such. Those who were not committed to the church and to the ministries of the church remained the same. And those who, uh, who, who did not know the Lord and had come with their family members and this and that and the other, or who had been backslidden and came up and, and would confess and get up and say, Hallelujah, I'm walking with God from now on, very often you wouldn't see them after the second week after the meeting was closed down. It's sad but true. It's sad but true. We live in a day in an age where we are so easily fooled. And it's because the church has become something other than what it was intended to be. And that is because there are men who did what these disciples did sitting around the table with the Lord. They came in, they listened to God's Word, they had a little discussion about it, and then everything turns to themselves. Yeah. Who among us will be greatest? Who among us is going to be number one? Who among us is going to be the leader? That goes on a lot today. It goes on a lot today. And it's very sad because the people sitting in the pews are often the victims of such spiritless preaching. And it's no wonder that some of you have so much trouble trying to live a life that's pleasing unto God. Because they'll lay out for you a list of things to do and don't do. And tell you, if you'll do all this, everything will be just fine. Pat you on your pointed little head and send you on down the way and say, I've done my job. If it doesn't work, they didn't follow my advice. Yeah, that's right. Amen? That's what they'll do. But I'm telling you that your relationship with God is not based upon doing. It's not based upon abstaining. It's based upon abiding in the presence of God. That's what it's based upon. That's what it's based upon. And the same thing is true of the man of God. 
If you want to be a preacher, and God knows I can't see why anybody would, it's not all that great of a job, let me tell you. You're not nearly as adored and appreciated as some would have you believe. In fact, there are those who ostracize you, hate you. If you're a preacher in a small church like we have here, like I've pastored in the past, you have to go out and supplement your income. You've got to work with your hands. And when you do that, people, there's the preacher. They don't want to eat lunch with you. They don't want to have fellowship. They want to hang around you. They don't want to see you. They don't want to work with you. Why? Because they're afraid you're going to talk about Jesus to them. Well, in most cases, they're safe. Because a lot of them wouldn't say a word about the Lord Jesus Christ outside of the pulpit because they're off the clock. Amen, amen. I'm sure that they aren't down at the golf course when they're shooting a few rounds talking to the caddies about their souls. I'm sure they might have to shove him an extra 20 every now and then not to tell on them for shooting out an obscenity over a bad shot they made. Hey man, I know if you'd followed me around the job sites from time to time, I've bashed my thumb with a hammer. And it's funny how you hit that thumb and you get that thing all purple and swelled up real good and then you can't miss it for the next two weeks. <laughs> It's like a magnet grows in that thing. And every time you get near it, you're hitting it again with the hammer. Well, listen, there have been times when, when I've said some things I shouldn't ought to have said. Sure enough, I know it's hard to believe, but it's absolutely true. I could be a downright devil when, uh, when I let myself go my own way. But, 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 as long as I'm going the Lord's way, you'd be amazed at the difference in my attitude and the difference in my actions. And it's not because I adhere to a list of do's and don'ts. It's not because that I have a set pattern by which I do everything. It's because that I try to keep the Lord in my consciousness all the time. I, I, as Mike said, I try to live in an attitude of prayer. To ask God uh, openly and in, in my heart throughout the day, Lord, what must I do? Lord, I don't know how to solve this problem. Lord, how do I cut this angle? I can't figure it out. We prayed when we worked together. We'd pray over our lunch and pray that God would put wisdom in our minds and skill in our hands that our work might be something that would magnify His name. Because the last time, last thing the world needs is another lazy, no good preacher going around beating people when he's working for them on the side. Amen? Amen. I'll tell you something else that the world doesn't need any more of. That's imitators. There's a lot of people who build their ministry by mimicking and parroting somebody down the line who they've seen that they were enamored with. They're so impressed with them that whether consciously or not, they begin to adopt their mannerisms. They begin to preach exactly like they do. If they always use a six-point message, well, they they always use a six-point message. If they've got a particular uh, 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 mannerism that always gets the crowd going, well, you can be sure they're going to adopt it so they can get the crowd going. And they're going to do everything they can to present themselves in a way that they think is going to win their audience onto their side. Ask me how I know this. It's because I've done it. I've done it. When I was a young preacher, I went through six or seven different styles of preaching before I finally figured out what the Lord wanted from me. I mean, I preached like everybody from Buster Seaton to Phil Kidd to, uh, 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 oh man, what's that preacher's name? He's an old man, I can't think of his name right now. But, but yeah, no, uh, uh, no, no, not Ruckman. Good grief, no. <laughs> Why would anybody want to preach like Brother Ruckman? I love him, but thank God there's only one of him. Amen, amen, amen. 
<laughs> but uh, this one old preacher, he, he was in his 80s, and when he'd preach, his voice would tremble. And he'd say, that's where I'm a-going, that's where I'm a-going. And I started at about 35 years old, preaching like that with that trembling voice, and it must have been a sight to behold. See some young, healthy rascal up there with my voice trembling like I was so feeble, I couldn't hardly suck my breath in to get the words out. What a joke, what a joke. You know what? But finally, God broke me of that. He finally broke me of that. God showed me something. God made me realize that He already had a Buster Seaton. He already had a Phil Kid. He had a Pete Ruckman. And he had a B.R. Lakin. That's who it was. Great man of God. Great man of God. He has one of those. And I'm sure anybody who you might admire and try to figure uh, to pattern yourself after that God is quite satisfied with the fact that He's already got one. He doesn't need another one. The thing that we need to realize, and this is something that was manifested in Peter's life in particular later on down the line, is this, that God does not want you to be what you think you ought to be. Amen. Amen. Peter pictured himself as the hero. He pictured himself as fearless. He pictured himself as the example for everybody else. He was the one who would never leave the Lord, never forsake Him, who would go with Him even to death. But look what happened to him. Amen. Well, after the Lord got him humbled down and then got him squared away, he did permit him to follow him in death. You see, when he had that attitude, though, when it was his fleshly desire to do that, to make himself look like something greater than what he could be than what he was, then God made him greater than something that he could ever conceive in his own mind. And that's what God wants to do with us. If we'll just let ourselves lay bare and open to God. The Bible tells us that everything is naked and open to the God with whom we have to do. So you can put on your airs and, and, and you can get up and go into your little act. But honey, God knows your heart. He knows what's in there. You can act bold as a lion, but He knows that you're really a trembling little mouse. You can act like you're educated. He knows you're dumber than a rock. You can act like you're, like, like you're the greatest thing to ever come down the pike and you're fearless and you're always doing this and that everywhere you go but God knows that you never open your mouth for him outside of the church house I'm telling you God wants you to be who you are and he'll take that and he'll sanctify it and he'll anoint it and use it for his glory the greatest thing that I ever figured out was who I was you know that that the, the Lord wants us to die to self. Amen. He wants us to die to self. And the only way that you can die to self is to figure out who self is. Amen. Who he really is. Who she really is. We live in a world that is filled with illusion. A world where we're surrounded by counterfeits. You can get counterfeit Rolexes. You can get fake Gibson guitars. You can get counterfeit everything. Women run around with fake eyelashes on. You don't know what color the hair is. <laughs> Amen, amen, amen. My Lord, have mercy. I've seen women before, I bet, after they got married, when the first time their husband seen them, they had all that barn pain on them. He liked to have a heart attack. He said, Lord, what have I done? What have I done? Listen, and men, you ain't no better. Amen, amen. You old stinking things, you, you run around, get your high karate or whatever kind of aftershave they wear now. I, something, I don't know, axe or something was what my boys wanted. They get that stuff and spray the cells up with it. It smelled like a French whorehouse. Pardon my, pardon my plainness of speech in there. I thought, good gosh almighty, well, you want to kill them or attract them? I can't even breathe in the same room with you. They didn't want them to know what they really smelled like. See, we want to present a persona that we think is better than what we in reality are. But that ain't who God loves. God loves you. Amen. He loves you with all your faults. All your faults. 
He loves you. And He knows more about you than you know about yourself and loves you anyways. And until we can come to the place where that we can accept that, that God loves me. And when God saved me, He didn't save me. So He'd have Him another Elijah or another Jeremiah, another Isaiah, another Peter, another Paul, another Mark, Matthew, Luke, or John. He saved me so He would have me uniquely so that He can take and work a miracle of grace in my heart and make me into something that can bring glory and praise to His name for the ages to come. Amen, amen, amen. And that is so important, particularly in the ministry, that we be real, that we be real. The world is sick to death of fakes and counterfeits. I remember there was a, uh, a musical group. I don't know the name of them, but it's some, a couple of, uh, of uh, uh, black guys from somewhere, and they were supposed to be great singers and stuff, and they got exposed in one of their concerts. They go out to do a concert, and somebody, and somebody messed you the... Uh, the tape or something, and so they're up there going, blah, 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 and the music, the words were behind them, looked like one of them kung fu movies that's done in Chinese, and, and the, then the English subtitles, you know, the lips move, and then the words come. Well, oh my goodness, oh, oh, they're faking, they're faking. We hate that, we don't want that. And you know what, once they found that out, they totally rejected it. Well, in spiritual matters, uh, you may not have somebody following you around with a tape deck while well, you move your mouth and they push the button and get out of time with them and get caught, but you cannot fake spirituality for very long. Amen? Amen. And be sure of this. Your sins will find you out. Mine find me out. That's why I keep myself fessed up and, and uh, prayed up and asking God to cleanse me from my sins. All oh, ain't nothing wrong with, with confessing your sin to God. I highly, strongly advise it. Some people act like 1 John chapter 1, 9 and 10. He's talking about getting saved. No, he's talking to save people about staying right, staying in fellowship with the Lord. They say, well, He can't cleanse you from your sins because uh, you've already been saved and you've been cleansed. No, my friend. No, listen. He's forgiven us all transgressions through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. But as far as your walk goes, as far as your life goes, there are things about you that God ain't too crazy about. There are things that you do that you know are wrong and you wish that you weren't doing them. And when you confess those faults to God, those sins to God. Then He begins to work in you and fulfill what Matthew said uh, in Matthew chapter number 1, speaking of Jesus, that He would save His people from their sins. I believe it's 1 in 32 if I'm not mistaken. But see, he, when He cleanses you, He's purging you of the sins. He's purging away the dross. He is washing your, He's washed your soul. He's saved your soul. Your spirit's been born again and joined and become one spirit with the Lord. And now He wants to clean up your life. And this is a process of sanctification that takes place throughout our lives. And each of us has to have it. Problem is, there's some who put on air so long that they don't realize that it applies to them as well. They think that God's already pretty happy with them. They never say it out loud, but in their hearts they believe God got a pretty good deal when He got them. Amen? That's what some of them believe. That they've been living in, 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 as a mimic and a parrot and, and as a fake and a counterfeit for so long that they don't even know what the real them is anymore. Well, we know a preacher here in this town who said he can preach exactly like any preacher that's famous, uh, the Georgia Bunch down there and all them. He said he can preach just like any one of them anytime he wants to. And I go, hmm... Well, who's he when he preaches, when I hear him? Yeah. Who's preaching to me? Yeah. Amen. Amen. 
I'm like that. I, I, I got an inquiring mind. I want to know. <laughs> I want to know. Brother, I'd rather see somebody get up here and stammer and stumble around who, who has a hard time stringing eight or nine words together and speaks from their heart than the most eloquent man on the face of God's earth who's a fake. Amen. Amen. I certainly would. I certainly would. And I'll tell you something else. I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't give you a nickel for the, what goes for a worship service in a lot of churches today. Sitting at home today, I turn the TV on, and there's all kinds of, of uh, religious programming on there. Yeah. I, I was amazed. I mean, I, I went to like five different churches in 40 minutes, <laughs> and I wouldn't have sat in any of them for five minutes if I'd been there in person. Right. I wouldn't have done it. Wouldn't have done it, man. Wouldn't have done it. Fake. 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 Putting on a show. Putting on a show. And they've got people who are willing participants in the deception. That's right. That's right. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Oh, uh, you've got heart trouble. Don't worry. God's going. Yeah, don't get a babysitter for your baby when you go have the surgery. You won't need it. God, do that. And then what's he going to do with that poor little kid after? It's you know, it's real easy to sit in a TV studio somewhere and tell people what God's going to do and what they ought to do. It wouldn't be so easy if you were the one who had to take up the slack when your words didn't come to pass, would it? And the world knows that. They know that. They know that. The people that you work around know you. Your family knows you. So, when you all of a sudden... I'm not talking about being a new creature. We all ought to do that. We ought to. But when you all of a sudden adapt... Not, I'm not talking about just quitting cussing like a sailor. I'm talking about when you start talking different, completely. When your, all your mannerisms change and all that stuff. You're, if, if you got lost family, they think you've gone cuckoo. He's gone nuts. Because they know you. You know what would be a whole lot better? Would be if they seen the same old you with a clean mouth. Yeah. If they saw the same old you with a heart filled with love. They're impressed with, with your high sounding talk. And they really don't appreciate it when, when you berate them over the things that you did with them for 20 or 30 years. That ain't what people want to hear. Ain't nobody ever got saved. They know what they're doing is wrong. Lord have mercy. They need to know about the Savior. That's what they need to hear about. And when you're at work, this is something where Christians really give God a bad name at work. The ones who will witness. Some of them, and I've seen it, and had, and had to talk to them about it before. Some of them will get in on a job and they'll spend uh, four out of the eight hours that a man's paying them to work talking. Yeah. Yeah. Talking. And they're not just talking to themselves. They're distracting two or three other people from doing their job. That's, right. That's a bad testimony. Amen. That's a bad testimony. Listen, uh, you go in there and you conduct yourself circumspectly you bless your food. Don't make a big show of everything. It, it, in humility. Walk before God in humility. And they'll see that and they'll know that it's genuine. Amen. But them people who come in, oh, 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 oh uh, unless that, that now don't get me wrong, I know people who, who are like that. Brother Mike talked about Big John. Big John Whitaker, that's where he was everywhere he went. He wasn't faking. Amen. He wasn't putting on an act. It got to the point where when I'd see him at Kmart or somewhere, if I saw him first, I don't care if I was 50 yards away, I'm yelling, Hallelujah, brother! And run up there and grab him and hug him. He about 
squeeze your lungs out of you. He's so big when he'd hug on you. But, uh, you know, I mean, but that was John. Yeah. If I went around doing that stuff, it just ain't going to look right. Yeah. You know, it ain't going to look right. It won't because that's not me. I just did it with him playing with him because I love him and I know he loved me. And, and people, people know when you're real. And unless, unless they uh, believe that you are real, then they sure ain't going to believe that God's real. No. Right. Amen. Amen. So I guess what I'm trying to say tonight, and something that I think would be most helpful to people, would be for us to, to earnestly seek God's face and ask Him to show, oh man, mm, this is touchy ground. I remember praying this once. I asked him to, to reveal what you need to you. I won't tell you to ask him what I asked him because he answered my prayer and about killed me. I'm, I'm who I am today because of it though. Because God's got a way of stripping, stripping all of the facade away and bringing you down to who you really are. You know? And that, that's who He saved. I mean, when you get ready, He saved you. Who you are. And He loved you. And I'm telling you, He can use you who you are. Where you are. That's the truth. I remember back in the 70s, 80s, you don't hear much about it anymore, but, but uh, you know, the Christian psychology, yeah, the Christian psychology, yeah, and there's Christian strip clubs too, you know. <laughs> psychology is of the world. Yeah. There's no, it's not in the Bible. There's no psychology. I'll tell you what's in the Bible. This is here. If we abide in the light as He's in the light. Yeah. Amen. Amen. If we abide in Him, then our joy will be full. See? But, but people don't want to abide in Him. They don't want to abide in Him. But, but the, I remember back in the 70s and uh, early 80s, I guess it was, when uh, there was this big thing. Oh, they wrote uh, dozens of books, maybe hundreds, I don't know. But they had radio programs about it and all this stuff and whole whole little ministries sprouted up around this idea of, uh, of uh, uh, ministerial burnout. You remember that? But it's where uh, a preacher just all of a sudden wasn't happy in the ministry anymore. He was burnt out. He was burnt out. You know why? Because he is what I was talking about at the beginning of the message. He's somebody who made a career choice and it just so happened that the wheel of fortune landed on preaching. He said, okay, I'll give that a try. That's a pretty respectable job. I won't be out in the cold or shoveling snow or something. Well, you, you better be careful. You might be. <laughs> Amen. But they get in there and they go to the school and they learn how to, all the things to do to to build this work up and this and that and the other. And they discover that even doing all the stuff and even with a measure of success as men view success, that they're empty inside. Yeah. And the reason they're empty inside is because they started out the race thinking which of them should be accounted the greatest instead of focusing on He who is the greatest. If you want to be happy, if you want to be happy, then you have to abide in the Lord Jesus Christ. You have to. You have to. Uh, Paul said, God forbid that I should glory, saving the cross, of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. Paul said, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. 
In the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. See, he's what Christianity is all about. He is. He is. Not big buildings. Not fancy choirs and robes. Not, not having your face on a business card it's saying that you're a minister of the gospel, DD, THD, PCP, LSD, whatever, <laughs> whatever they put on them. None of that stuff has, is of any eternal consequence. What matters is that you know Him. And that goes from the pulpit to the back pew that you know Him. That you know Him. That's what eternal life is all about. Jesus said in John 17 and 3, This is eternal life, that they may know Thee, the one true God, and Jesus Christ, whom Thou hast sent. I said when we had our question and answer night last week, that I, sure I'm glad I'm not going to hell, but that ain't what really excites me about salvation. The thing that excites me about salvation is the fact that I know my Creator that I know He loves me. Amen. And that He wants to fellowship with me. Amen. God, oh Lord God in Jesus' name, may You impress that on the hearts of these people. Amen. Thank You. God bless you.